very much what they expected a capitalist to be like. In the Suez Crisis of 1955, he lined up with the Soviets against the British and the French and the Israelis. What is certain is that Dulles had what we may call the instinct for command. This is something that's very important. There's a type of person who, out of the very certainty of his purpose, right or wrong, assumes leadership and is conceded leadership. Douglas MacArthur was such a man. So was Charles de Gaulle. So we have seen was Lenin. There's an old Scottish saying that celebrates this kind of individual where McCrimmon sits is the head of the table. For exercising power, this instinct to command is a far, far more important thing than brilliance of mind or eloquence of speech or charm of manner. After World War II, Dulles revived his interest in religion and became active in the National Council of Churches. He had been at the Versailles Conference as a young aide, and now he also concerned himself again with foreign policy. He helped negotiate the Japanese Peace Treaty, and in 1953, Eisenhower made him Secretary of State. Not only was he now in office, so was his moral sanction of the Cold War, the inevitable conflict. John Foster Dulles was not a popular figure with liberals of my generation. Some of us agreed with Reinhold Niebuhr, the noted theologian, who once said, Mr. Dulles's moral universe makes everything quite clear, too clear. Self-righteousness is the inevitable fruit of simple moral judgments. Holding and remembering, as I do, these attitudes, I think it well to let Mr. Dulles speak for himself. This he did at this, his father's church, on October 11th, 1953. terrible things that are happening in some parts of the world are due to the fact that political and social practices have been separated from spiritual content. That separation is almost total in the Soviet communist world. There the rulers hold a materialistic creed which denies the existence of moral law. It denies that men are spiritual beings. It denies that there are any such things as eternal verities. Any nation which bases its institutions on Christian principles cannot but be a dynamic nation. The Cold War was more than a moral and religious crusade. So long as it remained cold, avoided brute force, it came very close to being a Christian crusade. There was even that hint that it had the personal endorsement of Jesus. There was a further and much greater consequence. The moral case of Christians east of the Iron Curtain could not be inferior to that of their co-religionists in the West. They were as entitled to rescue as those of the West were to defense. The Dulles case for the Cold War therefore became a case for liberation, for rolling back the Iron Curtain. You will see the basic problem that I stress. If immorality was the faith of Soviet policy, morality had to be the test of ours. We would have to live up to our own precepts. But this we couldn't do, and perhaps no country could. The Dulles policy, therefore, had within it the seeds of its own contradiction and defeat. But this was in the future. For the moment, after Czechoslovakia, after China, after Korea, though Eisenhower had brought that war to an end, there was no opposition. The world was set for a further perilous passage not yet completed.
was co-chairman with Dean Acheson in the latter 50s of one of the minor intellectual organs of the Democratic Party, the Democratic Advisory Council. Acheson was chairman for foreign policy, and I was chairman for domestic policy. At our meetings, Acheson attacked Ellis, lucidly, brilliantly, and with a kind of resourceful invective for being too soft on the Soviets. And the drafting of our foreign policy resolutions consisted, I sometimes thought almost exclusively, of toning down, often only a very little, Acheson's virtual declarations of war. That was the nature of the political opposition in those days. At the more practical level, the Pentagon developed weapons systems that were often duplicating, sometimes competitive, and which were routinely approved. The word Pentagon itself became a synonym for military bureaucracy and military influence. And a large and growing industry responded to its needs. We see now the beginning of the movement from the faith to the competitive trap. One of the great military developments of the time, of all time, Polaris, tells the story. In the 1950s, the Navy faced the fate of the man bomber. Surface ships, including aircraft carriers, were vulnerable to homing missiles might still be justified, but they were no longer a decisive weapon. And the solution was Polaris. Polaris was born here at Woods Hole on Cape Cod in 1956. People could assemble here for a summer in seeming innocence. The project was codenamed Nobska, after the lighthouse. Eminent scientists assembled. Edward Teller. Columbus Isselin of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. He brought a profound knowledge of the ocean depths. And Robert Oppenheimer was not asked. His commitment to weapons development was in doubt. He'd questioned the wisdom of developing the H-bomb, so his security clearance had been lifted. Present also were people from MIT and the academic establishment, and the weapons manufacturers, IBM, the Navy, the chiefs of staff. A symbiosis of the armed services, industry, the scientists, and the engineers. The problem to be solved here and around the Whitney House, how to devise a means of firing nuclear missiles from a submarine under water. It succeeded. It is now believed that Polaris was an answer to a Soviet threat that had not yet developed. It then produced the response with which it had been intended to deal. But this is a trivial detail in the larger game. In that game, we do what encourages the Soviet response, and they do what encourages our response. There had been a failure of intelligence on Soviet achievement, but initiation on either side does not wait on accurate intelligence on what the other side is doing. Good intelligence only stimulates the response. Our intelligence operation, the CIA, was now under Alan Dulles. He is not remembered for his capacity to avoid error. We do not know, I should say I do not know, the exact conjunction of interests that produces the Soviet initiative and response. But we do know that bureaucracies, great organizations, are much the same the world around. It is fair to assume since Stalin's day, perhaps before, that the Soviet organizations that develop and make weapons